Hello, everyone. My name is Will Pearson, and I'm a fourth year medical student here at the Medical College of Georgia. And today I'll be presenting a case report on meconium peritonitis and then discussing some causes of neonatal scrotal masses. So the patient in question is a four-month-old boy born to a 23-year-old G1 P0 woman at 40 weeks and three days. The mother had no significant medical history and took no medications. And on prenatal ultrasound, uh, the boy was noted to have an enlarged scrotal sac. On uh, newborn exam, he was noted to have normal external male genitalia and bilaterally descended testicles, and again was noted to have an enlarged scrotal sac. He was circumcised and discharged on day of life three with referral to ped surgery uh, for evaluation of a possible inguinal hernia. On his visit to his first pediatrician, uh, his pediatrician noticed that he had a round, firm, mobile, non-tender mass in his left lower scrotum that was not associated with the testicle, and at that time he was referred to ped urology. Upon evaluation by both ped surgery and ped urology, um, he was again uh, noted to have three P-sized firm masses in his left lower scrotum consistent with previous exams. So from there, uh, some imaging was obtained, the first of which was an ultrasound. You can play the video here. Um, and on the ultrasound, he was noted to have a tubular structure in the left scrotum suggested of a left inguinal hernia. Uh, Doppler flow of the left testicle was normal for both arterial and venous flow. And then he was noted to have three hyperechoic nodules uh, with evidence of focal calcifications uh, in, in the left hemiscrotum. And here we just have some still images uh, from that ultrasound and we can see the uh, calcified masses uh, within the scrotum. And then here's just another view from that ultrasound. A uh, KB was obtained, which showed small focal calcification in the right abdomen, inferior to the bottom posterior rib, as well as a normal gas pattern. And then an X-ray of the pelvis, again, showed uh, the focal calcifications in the inferior aspect of the left scrotum. As far as tumor markers are concerned, his LDH was initially elevated slightly, uh, but that downtrended over about a month. Um, and his HCG and his AFP were normal. An MRI was obtained, uh, which again, re-demonstrated the hernia, as well as showed few small T1, T2 hypo-intense nodules without enhancement in the left hemiscrotum. And at this time, they were, uh, these masses were thought to be uh, focal calcification secondary to previous meconium peritonitis that had settled dependently through a patent process vaginalis into the left hemiscrotum. And we can see your T2 image here. And we can here see a close-up of the masses here. And then an axial view here of these masses behind the behind the left testicle. So following that workup, given the lack of blood flow and enhancement, given their hypomobility and the fact that there was multiple lesions, um, as well as the focal calcifications, um, these masses were thought to be uh, meco calcified meconium peritonitis that had, again, passed through a patent process vaginalis into the, the left hemiscrotum. As far as plan of care for this patient, uh, surgical removal was planned for a later date uh, once the patient had time, some time to mature, and the inguinal hernia would be addressed at that time as well. So what is meconium peritonitis? It is the intraperitoneal extrusion of meconium through a small bowel perforation while in utero and through inflammation and sterical, sterile chemical peritonitis, uh, the meconium against be becomes progressively calcified and can form a mass within the peritoneum. It occurs in roughly one out of 35,000 live births and is heavily associated with a whole host of GI tract abnormalities, some of which I've listed here. Anything that can cause an insult to the GI tract that can cause allow meconium to escape into the peritoneum can cause meconium peritonitis. As far as management for these patients, diagnosis is typically made on prenatal ultrasound, although an MRI can be completed uh, if an ultrasound is inconclusive. And the goal for these patients is to identify the associated GI tract or abnormality that allowed or caused the meconium to be extruded into the peritoneum. Um, and these patients should ideally be delivered at a level three nursery with pediatric surgery available so that any identified uh, abnormalities can be dealt with once the patient has been has been delivered safely. So from there, we will move on to our causes of neonatal scrotal masses. Obviously, meconium peritonitis can be one of them. Uh, we will start with some extra te testicular causes and then move into some testicular causes. So the first extra testicular cause is a uh, oop, is a neonatal 
neonatal hydrocele. Um, it occurs in roughly 10% of boys at birth and is more common in preterm babies as there's been less time for the process of vaginalis to obliterate in those patients. Hydrocele's obviously can be communicating or non-communicating. They can be primary or they can be secondary. However, in neonates, they're typically congenital hydrocele's due to the lack of obliteration of the patent process or of the process processes vaginalis. As far as management for these patients is concerned, um, they're typically observed uh, for a spontaneous closure until about one to two years of age. Um, and they rarely resolve on their own after age two. So a, a surgical repair is typically pursued at that point. As far as contralateral repair is concerned, only about 7% of patients who present with a unilateral hydrocele um, have a contralateral recurrence at a later date. And so therefore, routine exploration of the contralateral side is not recommended. Although it is interesting to note that uh, patients are more likely to recur on the right side following an initial left-sided repair than vice versa. Next on the list is the neonatal inguinal hernia, a very common occurrence. It occurs in up to five to overall incidence of about 5% in, in neonates, with uh, this rate being as high as 30% in preterm infants. The majority of patients present unilaterally, although about 10 to 15% of patients will uh, develop a metachronous contralateral hernia at some point in the future. The overall risk of uh, a contralateral hernia is about 5.8% in all children, although in kids who present initially at less than six months, that risk is about 10 to 12 to 12.4%. Uh, so obviously there's some variability there. And the main risk of a neonatal inguinal hernia is obviously the risk of incur bowel incarceration. Um, and this rate can be as high as 30% in neonates, although there's, again, some discrepancy in the literature as far as that rate is concerned. So um, it's not 100% clear what that is. And um, the risk of incarceration is higher in preterm infants than it is in, in, in normal uh, neonates born at full term. So given that there's been a lot of there's a lot of a lot out there on uh, management of neonatal inguinal hernias in general, I'd like to focus this discussion specifically on management of uh, inguinal hernias in preterm infants. So there's not uh, solid solid guidelines and a consensus exactly as to uh, optimal timing of repair and management of these patients. So a survey uh, done by Sikowski et al. Uh, showed that roughly 53% of surgeons will repair. Uh, a neonatal inguinal hernia in preterm infants on an outpatient basis following NICU discharge, whereas the other half of, of physicians will complete their repair while on an inpatient basis. And this is typically driven by the risk of anesthesia and the risk of comorbid conditions associated with prematurity. Another study showed that there is roughly a 16% overall risk of incarceration of inguinal hernias in preterm infants with a proportional increase risk of incarceration uh, with increasing gestational age. So those patients who are repaired uh, at greater than 40 weeks of gestational age had a roughly a 21% risk of incarceration, while those repaired at less than 36 weeks had only an 11% risk of incarceration. The study also showed that there is roughly a 28% risk of incarceration um, between the time the patient is diagnosed and between the time they come back at a subsequent hospitalization for repair of their inguinal hernia. Another study showed that repair greater than one week after diagnosis was associated with significant increased risk of incarceration, post-op recurrence, and testicular atrophy. And this is con consistent with the, with the lots at, let all, at all study. However, on the opposite uh, side of the spectrum, uh, one study showed that there's only a 4.6% risk of incarceration in these preterm infants and that there was no incarceration events between NICU discharge um, and scheduled outpatient uh, follow-up surgery for uh, repair of their inguinal hernia. And then another study showed that there was comparable incarceration rates between those repaired within two weeks and those repaired uh, after that. So you can see there's sort of a, a discrepancy in the data as far as uh, optimal timing of repair uh, for patients, uh, for preterm infants with in inguinal hernias. Um, as far as uh, complications are concerned, the risk of recurrence, vas injury, and testicular atrophy is between about 1% and 8%. And these studies found that there was relatively, a relatively higher uh, risk of complication uh, if, if the surgery was done at less than 43 weeks gestational age. So with that, uh, we have two more studies, and these were perhaps the strongest, um, newest, with the, with the most amount of data. Um, and the first one showed that there was no observed difference in incarceration uh, rates between repair during uh, the NICU stay and, and, and following NICU discharge. However, they did find that there was higher rates of recurrence, reoperation, and respiratory complications um, for patients that are operated on during their NICU stay versus uh, following, NICU, following NICU discharge.
Additionally, another study showed that there was significantly shorter post-op hospital stay uh, for those patients who are repaired on an outpatient basis following NICU discharge uh, compared to those that are operated on while inpatient. And in order to uh, specifically answer this question, there's actually a study going on down in Vanderbilt right now. Uh, it's a randomized control trial uh, with the two arms being the first of early repair while uh, the patient is inpatient in the NICU versus late repair at 55 to 60 weeks gestational age uh, following this NICU discharge. Outcomes for this study, uh, primary outcomes include adverse events, which includes things like incarceration, reoperation rates, operative complications, um, as well as length of hospital stay. And secondary outcomes include costs and infant development scores later in life. So with that, we will move on to our testicular causes of uh, neonatal masses, the first of which is neonatal torsion, uh, the incidence of which is about 6.1 per 100,000 live births. And these can be either extravaginal or intravaginal torsions. An extravaginal occurs torsion occurs because of a loose attachment of the gubernaculum to the scrotal wall, uh, which allows the entire tunic tunica vaginalis sac and its contents to twist around the cord uh, within the scrotum. The gubernaculum typically reaches full strength at about three months of age, so extravaginal torsions are almost exclusively a needle na neonatal occurrence. An intravaginal torsion um, is the more classic idea of a torsion um, and occurs in, you know, older children all the way up through adults. And it's typically caused by that bell clap or deformity where the tunica vaginalis attaches too high on the posterior side of the, of the testicle, um, which allows the entire testicle and the cord and all of its contents to spin freely within the, within the tunica vaginalis itself. So given that, um, Extravaginal torsions typically occur before the age of three months. Uh, most neonatal torsions are actually extravaginal torsions. And these torsions can occur either in the prenatal, perinatal, or postnatal period. Those that occur prenatally uh, will typically present with an absent testicle or a small nubbin. Those that occur in the late prenatal slash perinatal period typically present with a painless scrotal mass as, that, uh, as a, essentially a non-viable testicle. Um, and then those that occur in the postnatal period will typically preserve, typically present in the normal uh, torsion fashion in which there's a bit of an observed healthy testicle, and then the patient presents with pain and swelling and so on. Neonatal torsion is associated with full-term vaginal births, breach presentation, and birth trauma. So as far as management for these patients is concerned, uh, postnatal torsions, again, present very much like a torsion like you'd see in an older child and an adult. Uh, and these patients should be managed with immediate det emergent detorsion with a bilateral orchiopexy. Um, however, those torsions that occur prenatally, um, they're more than likely uh, have occurred greater than 24 hours uh, prior to the to the point of presentation. And at this point, the, it's very unlikely that the testicle is still viable. So some experts believe in a delayed delayed exploration um, for these prenatal torsions, given the low salvage rates, the risk of anesthesia, and the rarity of an asynchronous contralateral torsion. Um, and theoretically, given that the gubernaculum typically matures at about three months of age, there's not a uh, ongoing risk of extravaginal torsion uh, in the future. So there may not be a theoretical uh, need for a contralateral orchiopexy in these patients. However, most uh, experts uh, still recommend uh, proceeding with uh, surgical or explanation of the torus testicle with as well as uh, contralateral orchiopexy in these patients. As far as rates or salvage are concerned, uh, the, the rates are highly variable. Uh, it can be as low as 6% in neonates, and this is likely due to the high prevalence of prenatal torsions um, in testicles that are, are non-viable the, at the time of presentation. Uh, but this number does go up to about 17% in, in infants. Neonatal torsion can present bilaterally um, in patients presenting with unilateral signs and symptoms. So this contralateral side should always be evaluated for, for torsion. Um, and in a patient with bilateral torsion, uh, a salvage uh, of, of both testicles should always be attempted given the risk of anarchia uh, if, you were, if they were to lose both testicles. Next on the list is uh, neoplasms. Uh, in neonates, the by far the most common, um, although an uncommon phenomenon, the most common uh, mass in testicular mass in a neonate is going to be the juvenile granulosa cell tumors. Uh, these are almost uniformly benign and they lack the associated endocrine abnormalities of other granulosa cell tumors. Uh, these masses can be treated with either a radical or a partial orchiectomy and these patients do not need metastatic or adjuvant therapy. 
However, uh, these masses are associated with chromosomal, chromosomal mosaicism and Y chromosome abnormalities. So following surgery, these patients should undergo chromosomal analysis. Yolk sac tumors and teratomas are also common young boys, although these patients typically present, uh, these masses typically present at a little bit of an older age compared to the juvenile granulosa cell tumors. Next on the list is the adrenal rest tumor, which is in the which is aberrant adrenal tissue that has been retained ectopically within the gonads. The growth of these masses is driven by ACTH, and given that these masses exhibit both adrenal and testicular cancer or testicular characteristics, um, some experts believe that these are actually latex stem cells that have been reprogrammed due to the high levels of ACTH in the body. Uh, these masses are particularly common in patients with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, with up to 20 to 40 percent of patients with classic CAH presenting with adrenal rest tumors. Um, and in patients with CAH, uh, the adrenal rest tumors are typically bilateral. Additionally, in patients with CAH, these masses are typically a lot bigger because they are ACTH driven. Uh, the growth of them is driven by ACTH. Um, given that patients with CAH have high levels of ACTH, these masses tend to be a lot bigger and cause a lot more problems. They can be seen in he healthy patients, although they're, like we just mentioned, they're typically a lot smaller given the lack of elevated ACTH. And they're most often found incidentally along the cord or on the testicle during explanation of the canal or the scrotum for some other reason. Uh, and while these masses do not have, are non-malignant themselves, uh, given their ACTH-driven growth, they can become quite large, exhibiting mass effect on the testicle, which, which can lead to infertility. So as far as diagnosis for these patients, they're typically uh, diagnosed on ultrasound, although they can be diff difficult to differentiate from Leydig cell tumors. They're typically eccentrically located and have posterior shadowing, which can help lead you into the, to the diagnosis. Ooh, let's go back a slide. Um, and males with congenital adrenal hyperplasia should be screened with ultrasound uh, starting in adolescence uh, to, to screen for these tumors. As far as management is concerned, those that are incidentally found uh, in patients without endocrine disease, uh, these can simply be observed. However, for hormone-driven tumors, size reduction of the mass can be done with either adequate or superphysiologic doses of glucocorticoid therapy. And su surgical excision can reduce pain uh, from these masses, but is unlikely to restore testicular testosterone and stem sperm production. Next on the list is the supernumerary testicle or polyorchidism, or essentially patients with uh, more than two testicles. Triorchidism is the most common, although tetra and pentraorchidism has been has been described. There's this phenomenon is very rare, with only about a hundred cases ever being reported, and is caused by an accidental division of the germinal ridge at less than eight, eight weeks gestation. They're slightly more common, le commonly left-sided, and they can be either orthotopic or ectopic, with about 75% of them being loaded, located intrascrotally. These masses can be further divided based on their uh, duct drainage. So those that are type A are remain drainage by a deferent duct, um, while those that are type B do not have uh, drainage by a deferent duct. And these testicles re retain about 50 to 65% of their reproductive potential, so they are functional testicles. They are heavily associated with ipsilateral hernias and cryptorchidism, as well as with malignancy. So as far as management for these patients are concerned, those that are those masses that are intrascrotal type A uh, supernumerary testicles, aka those that retain drainage by a deferic duct because they are still functional, like to preserve that tissue. So uh, given that there's no evidence of malignancy, they can simply be observed. Those that retain duct drainage and have no evidence of malignancy, however, their extrascrotal and orchiopexy can be done to move those uh, move those testicles back down into the scrotum. And then for any of these testicles that are have any evidence of malignancy or they're type, type B um, supernumerary testicle and that they lack a deferent duct drainage and orchiectomy is recommended given the, the risk of possible malignancy in the future. And last on the list is the splenogonadal fusion. Again, also very rare with only about 220 reported cases in the literature. Um, it is the abnormal association between gonadal and splenic elements that occurs uh, during about five to eight weeks of gestation as gastric rotation brings the splenic and gonadal elements in a close proximity. Given that the spleen is left-sided, this is almost an exclusively left-sided phenomenon and happens to be far more common in males. And it is most often uh, discovered incidentally uh, during workup for, for some other reason. 
So splenogonadal fusion can either be continuous with a, either a fibrous cord or some cord of splenic tissue connecting the spleen and the testicle, or it can be discontinuous in which there's simply ectopic splenic tissue that's been fused to the tunica albuginea within the scrotum. And while these masses are not uh, directly associated with the malignancy, they are heavily associated with cryptorchidism. And obviously there is the association of uh, malignancy with cryptorchidism. So as far as diagnosis for these masses is concerned, it's typically done with ultrasound. Although if ultrasound is inconclusive, a technetium 99 sulfur colloid liver spleen scan can be done to detect ectopic splenic tissue. And if those two things are inconclusive, then a biopsy can be considered for definitive diagnosis. Surgery is not required for these masses if the, if the mass is intrascrotal. However, if they're extrascrotal, uh, surgical excision um, at the time, of, surgical excision of the splenic elements uh, can be considered at the time of simultaneous archaeopexy. And that wraps up our discussion of neonatal scrotal masses. Uh, thank you all for your attention and um, have a great day.